Uh, the recording has started. As usual, a uh, bit of announcement. Um, you are being recorded. Um, <coughs> let me see if I can share my slides now. Um, And here we are. Um, usual quick summary uh, to allow other people to join us uh, in uh, in the next two or three minutes. The impact of digital revolution on our understanding of everything, reality included. Reality is what is outside the external world, or and or uh, ourselves. This morning we spoke about how the digital is affecting our self-understanding. We did that from the usual perspective of having a epistemological ontology. And I selected a few uh, variables uh, for our level of abstraction, time, space, interactions, and so forth. The last point was the digital gaze. We could have chosen different uh, variables uh, and have a different level of abstraction. Uh, it was as you often, uh, an attempt to show you how things can be done and uh, what results you get. Um, but each one of us should feel free uh, to develop their own personal um, sort of uh, analysis. This epistemological ontology of the self or ego poiesis, uh, previous uh, sort of topic just above anagnorisis, another Greek word, construction of the self, can be done through time but more foundationally, it can be done in terms of uh, characterizing the self. That can be done in terms of memory or narratives, uh, but the argument was that uh, whatever you adopt as a theory, uh, behind that adoption lies an informational understanding of the ways in which we construct the self and shape it and influence the self. On that, we discuss, uh, or no, I presented a few uh, ways in which this happens thanks to digital uh, technologies and how they are uh, technologies of the self, affecting way more deeply who we are and who we can be and how we can uh, uh, shape ourselves either autonomously, self, so regulating ourselves, or heteronomously. Now, in other words, it's the outside that tells us who we are, who we can be, what we can or cannot do, etc. I said that we could put all this on one side and concentrate on um, one even more general um, uh, point. So once we have all this, uh, as it were, in a little box, discussing that box. The discussion is what we're going to do now, the anagnorisis uh, that is the topic that we're going to address in the next slide. So this is what we uh, covered, interactions, memory, time, space, embodiment, digital gaze, in, in the sense uh, that uh, ICTs, information and communication technologies, uh, can act as technology of the self. But all this is also subject to a particular way in which we ourselves, and there was one of the questions that was asked uh, towards the end uh, of our uh, meeting, um, manage our own uh, self-construction. That is the logical realization or anagnorisis that I'm going to illustrate uh, in the next slides. Um, it comes, as I told you, from Aristotle uh, poetics, um, and realization is kind of a good um, translation for anagnorisis. Notice the little piece here, uh, gnorisis from uh, to know, um, gnosis is also uh, something that we use to describe a particular form of spiritualism or, or religious attitude. Um, it comes from um, uh, uh, the uh, same roots that uh, you have in gnosiology, so a theory of knowledge. Basically, this is a knowledge that uh, is realizing its own nature. In Aristotle, and that's why we're going to use it, is I provide you the uh, clarification there, is the protagonist sudden, normally, 
discovery or recognition. It's like the ha ha moment, the oh my goodness, that's the way things are of his, her, their own uh, character or someone else, the true identity, the true nature of who they are. Um, in this aha moment, this discovery moment, this realization moment of anagnorisis, something that had been there all the time but hadn't been seen before, unforeseen, becomes revealed. There are some classic examples. Uh, perhaps the most classic uh, is uh, Oedipus. But of course, there's also bits of this in Macbeth, in the Sixth Sense, uh, in the others. I don't want to ruin you the uh, the movies. Uh, I think you know about Macbeth. Um, uh, in Oedipus, certainly, uh, um, the moment of, oh, this is who I am, uh, becomes uh, tragic, uh, immensely painful. <laughs> This is what happens, logically speaking. I'll tell you about this in a moment. Let me uh, focus on uh, uh, Oedipus uh, for a second. You know the story. I mean, Oedipus is told that he will kill his father and uh, marry his uh, uh, mother. We say marry, but really having sex, uh, just to be clear. Um, and that is, you know, if anything, uh, doubly disturbing, you know, killing your father, having sex with your mother. I mean, welcome to Greek tragedies. Um, he runs away trying to avoid his faith. And of course, uh, on the road, he meets a man and he kills the man who ends up being his father. And on the way to the, another city, etc., uh, means this uh, queen has become a uh, widower. Well, the, the father has been killed uh, and uh, ends up being uh, the, uh, the new uh, spouse. So uh, what happens uh, is exactly how it was predicted. It's just that Oedipus does not know. Now, mind one fundamental point. The fundamental point is this, the facts do not change. The anagnorisis is not a matter of falsification of what was the case and you discover, oh, that was no longer the case. It isn't the case. I'll give you another couple of examples a bit no, lighter in a moment. Um, all the facts that uh, Oedipus has available, he knows that he has killed a man and he knows that he has married a woman, don't change. It's the interpretation, is what they mean that changes. So here's a little scheme uh, of what happens when you have an anagnorisis moment. You have an information flow, uh, something that uh, you, are, you have access to, and the anagnorisis is this information process, this epistemic change or changing knowledge, through which a later stage, things that have already happened no, in the past, in this information flow, uh, and no, no, uh, sorry, later and previous, they all change at the same time. So when you acquire new knowledge here, that forces the correct reinterpretation of the whole information flow previously and subsequently. This is crucial because um, um, normally uh, the um, falsification moment doesn't keep the facts as they are, but changes the facts. Imagine, for example, at some point we discover that uh, we don't live on a, on, a, on a flat earth. Well, that is not a moment of anagnorisis. It really changed the facts in front of us. But imagine uh, you have a sort of lighter example, uh, um, a case of, um, sorry, um, um, which is not here. Um, um, Three people, they all um, love each other, uh, but um, there's a bit of a tension. She loves both characters um, in the movie, uh, but there's something not quite right. And in the end, it turns out that, yeah, she loves both, but one is her brother and the other one uh, will be her lover. Um, no. uh, you don't have to have a uh, Princess Leila and uh, uh, solo and so on uh, to know what's going on here. Now, the uh, Star Wars um, moment uh, is exactly a moment of anagnorisis. The characters realize not that the facts have changed because their relation remains the same. They are still in love with each other, but it's the interpretation of their love that makes you know, things a little bit more manageable among the three of them. 
So this um, moment of anagnorisis is what we do all the time in terms of who we are and how we build our self-identity. As we move through life, we constantly reinterpret facts that cannot um, be undone in terms of their actual nature, but they become facts that get a different interpretation through a different narrative. Uh, oversimplifying, um, if until a couple of years ago, uh, my anagnorisis was that I was the guy who had become a professor in Oxford, etc. Well, that fact doesn't change. But today now is you know, my anagnorisis, my reappropriation of myself uh, in terms of who I am, is the guy who had you know, a certain amount of years as professor uh, in Oxford. But then that was a step towards uh, the professorship. But yeah, um, just to be trivial. Or imagine uh, that uh, you have had uh, a um, sentimental involvement with someone and it didn't work. I mean, some people will try to deny that it was love at the time, um, but it's much better to acknowledge that love have, hasn't changed. That at the time, it was love. And uh, it's just that you have changed, circumstances have changed, uh, the two individuals may, may have changed, and therefore what was love today gets interpreted as just a stepping stone, and uh, you know, the love of your life it was actually to be met in the future. That was not uh, the uh, ultimate uh, sort of... Uh, uh, realization of your sentimental hopes. Now, all this uh, goes without saying uh, that it is a constant editorial work on our side, and it helps to realize that it's part of this process of progressive detachment of the self from the world, and how this detachment and right distance between us and the world is reconstructed in terms of our self perspective, who we think we are, that anagnorisis is what the whole discussion this morning is subject to also when it comes to uh, digital technologies that try to or sometimes succeed in uh, transforming changing influencing ourselves so as we as individuals move through time now is the diachronic not change we uh, reinterpret who we are in light of the new facts without changing the truth of the facts, but changing their interpretation. That sort of uh, constant transformation is kind of inescapable, but it is possible to make it, make it critically explicit and be aware of exactly what we're doing. So once we realize that it is the self that is speaking about the self, then we may be able to appreciate it is actually through the self that information becomes self-aware. Now, this is a bit of, of a philosophical hard thing to digest, but imagine uh, the universe as um, this uh, sort of uh, amazing place where there are things, things that are uh, able to interact with other things uh, cognitively. Uh, they even become uh, aware of their cognition to the extent that like a dreaming god, dog, sorry, uh, can be elsewhere, although they are located uh, in, uh, uh, in the house. And then even further down the road, uh, they can be in charge of their destiny, so to speak. Uh, they can be uh, aware, uh, conscious, free, uh, semantically uh, um, uh, proficient, and therefore able to reconstruct through this anagnorisis or realization process, their own uh, story, who they are, uh, rewriting um, some bits, but normally reinterpreting the bits that have already been written. The text doesn't change. I'm still that book. Those chapters, I cannot pretend, for example, that I was in love with that person uh, five years ago or 10 or 20. Um, but I can reinterpret that, for example, as a stepping stone towards a much better relationship that I had with someone else, etc. Well, once we get all this under the microscope, then the further step is to realize that this is the only place where the universe is aware of itself, as far as we know. Now, the close as far as we know is crucial. Uh, one day we might get a signal uh, from uh, the other side of the universe saying, you're not alone. And that would be a major, major revolution in our self-understanding. At the moment, um, we are the only ones around. Uh, and to the best of our understanding, the universe becomes conscious uh, of itself only at this particular point uh, in 
history and evolution on this planet with this uh, strange species. Of course, uh, this is extraordinary on the one hand, but as I will argue at the end of this uh, lecture, it's also a bit trivial. This how come that we are the self-conscious moment of the universe? Isn't that extraordinary? Uh, what reasons, what, what made us so special? Why us, why not someone else? Now imagine that question asked by someone who actually won the lottery. He has this no, one billion dollars uh, lottery ticket in his hands or, or her hands. And, uh, and they say, why me? This is amazing. Uh, what is so special about me? Uh, nothing. You're reasoning about your luck after the event has happened. Of course, if things had not gone this way, we wouldn't be reasoning about us. We wouldn't have this lecture. We wouldn't be thinking about we being the conscious moment of this universe coming to uh, have an anagnorisis um, understanding of its uh, self. Um, but it's the logical order that uh, needs to be uh, taken care of. It's because we have won the lottery that we wonder what is so special about us that we won the lottery. And we need to realize that it is a lottery, so there is nothing special. Had we not won the lottery, we would have never been here discussing how amazing it is that we did. So had the universe gone uh, in a different uh, way, uh, had evolution happened elsewhere, had the planet Earth been just closer to um, the sun, by, I don't, I don't know how many few miles, but not much. We wouldn't be here having this uh, uh, amazement and extraordinary conversation in terms of the digital revolution, the changes, et cetera, et cetera. So once we uh, acquire this more humbly perspective, this is what happens. Now, uh, we as selves, uh, we are the ultimate negation of entropy uh, in terms of, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, technologies, metaphorically speaking, through which information I told you that uh, what you can, uh, what we can use to uh, model uh, anything, tem temporarily for a little while, uh, overcomes its own entropy. Now, entropy and, and again, entropy need probably a, a bit of explanation, just in case we have forgotten uh, our high school um, uh, lectures. Imagine the following two glasses. One glass has just water. The other glass has some ice in it. As the glass with ice goes towards the same status as just water, as glass with uh, ice warms up and the ice melts, entropy increases. In other words, uh, the flatness, the indiscrimination, the everything is like everything else um, uh, takes place. So the opposite of entropy, uh, I'm stretching a little bit, but not too much, is order. If you um, take the, a puzzle with all its bits and threw it up in the air and look at the floor, the entropy of that puzzle is probably as high as it could be. All over the place, no order, one piece like, like any other. Now, fast forward and start looking at the little kid who is putting the puzzle back into a picture. Entropy is decreasing, so negentropy is increasing, order is increasing, and there is something that we do all the time. So I used to joke, mm, the, the, the nasty little kid uh, with my mom, that um, you know, my, my room uh, had a, a perfect degree of entropy. It was a total mess. Nothing was in the right place. It was almost anything randomly placed or in any other uh, random corner. Didn't like that joke too much, my mom. Um, uh, it is remarkable that um, entropy does not dominate every corner of the universe, and there are corners of um, non-entropic forces. They are local. Uh, the Earth and nature and life on this planet is a form of negation of entropy uh, to some extent, and that's why temporarily that is the case. As you know, uh, ice tends to melt. Um, order tends to become disorder. You leave a building alone and a thousand years later it will be 
completely destroyed. The walls will have fallen, uh, the, the, the roof will be broken, uh, plants everywhere, uh, the, uh, the pipes will have uh, leaked and so on. It takes effort to fight entropy. It takes effort, energy, uh, to have ice in the water. That's us. We put, <laughs> oversimplifying, the ice in the water. We transform the world, uh, and we are the force that does that more than anything else, uh, as the sort of uh, organism that has uh, been um, rich by uh, evolution at this stage. We are that form of negentropy, uh, that special kind of, uh, and kind of is important, technology that is constantly fighting entropy and is constantly trying to put order where there is none, uh, transforming a messy room into a, a, a room you, you can actually sleep in, um, putting ice in the water, um, building as opposed to destroying, etc. Now, this is the, what that sort of sentence, a little bit cryptic, uh, means. In that context, what we are going to uh, no, uh, see is that humanity is um, a very special kind of information pattern. If we use uh, information as the tool to model reality and the self, and remember, we are modeling. We're not saying we are intrinsically information patterns. We are saying a fruitful way of modeling the self in the 21st century after the digital revolution, in line with the digital revolution, is to look at the self digitally as an information pattern but then, from the same perspective, that's what you get uh, on this slide. Some uh, elements in the world are just things. Simple patterns, uh, normally of forces. We perceive them as substance substances, but they are mostly not relations. Some of these things are also organisms, meaning that they have an interaction with the world and they can adapt to the world. Um, and they could be uh, as good as a tree or as my dog. Uh, and some of these organisms are, are minds. They are intelligent and self-aware. In that, no, one, two, three, things, organs, minds, where do we put artificial agents? And I would argue that uh, they are neither in the things nor in the minds, but they are a kind of, to be specified when we will get that lecture, of organisms. They are agents, they can interact with the world, they can learn from their interactions, so feedback, and therefore they have a, uh, a equilibrium in terms of uh, successful interactions with the world, but they don't have those features that we saw today of a self, of a goal, no, autonomy, self-regulation in that sense, not simply changing my own rules, but wanting something, having an interest, uh, a passion for, the ability to be elsewhere, as opposed to being present and located in the same place, and so on. So they're not minds, they're not things, they're some kind of organism. And going back to one of the questions that was asked this morning, we don't have a framework to understand this new form of agency. Happy to uh, come back to you, uh, I guess, in a few years, uh, uh, because that's one of the things I'm working on. But if you look at the philosophy of agency, if you pick up the, St the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the entry on uh, agency or philosophy of agency, what you will find is agency of minds. At most, maybe perhaps controversially of high level, so to speak, organisms. But it would not be about mindless, totally mindless agency. For a classic philosopher, mindless agency is a contradiction in terms. It would be like talking about a happily married bachelor. Meaningless. I don't think so. Uh, but trust me, uh, I have had uh, enough hard time with my colleagues to know that this is controversial. Um, in fact, actually, uh, we're on record, so I need to be careful. Um, but one of the reviewers of the, of the book that is, that is forthcoming, The Ethics of uh, AI, uh, had a thrashing, thrashing comments on the fact that I clearly was uh, out of my mind, thinking that it was even possible to talk about agency when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, because agency is behavior, behavior requires uh, minds and intention and uh, goals. And uh, 
Uh, luckily, I was able to reply uh, sufficiently well to, uh, to withstand uh, the criticism, and so that chapter is still there. But now, whether right or wrong, uh, I think it's worth inquiring uh, whether in these information patterns that we have, things, organisms, and minds, we might need to include a fourth category that is artificial agents who are neither biological nor brutal agents natural, such as rivers or volcanoes or earthquakes, which make a difference to the world, but cannot change their behavior. The difference they make is always the same difference. With a joke, a river cannot make a difference to the difference that it makes. It can only make a difference. An artificial agent can make a difference to the difference it makes, and that is a fundamental change. And luckily, that is a logical point that even someone that critical like that sort of reviewer cannot deny. So one zero and the chapter stays. Next, only minds are capable of doing all this um, reconsidering. So only minds are capable to interpret information patterns, uh, things, organisms, cells, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the point of uh, self-awareness um, and uh, anagnorisis plays a fundamental role. In this context, uh, and we're almost done with this, um, this are uh, all uh, short comment before we move to uh, the next topic. Um, this construction of the self, the role that the digital has uh, in it as a technology of information, once you interpret the self informationally, and going way, way more deeply than I have done in the last no, two hours and a half um, in understanding all this. Well, these are all unprecedented phenomena. We haven't seen them before. Uh, we haven't been through a, a digital revolution uh, in the past. Um, as usual, um, uh, unprecedented phenomena require some open-mindedness and a lot of critical thinking, which means that, no, good news for anyone in this room, uh, there's an immense amount of intelligent and exciting explorations to be made. Self-oyesis today uh, means tinkering digitally with the self with unknown and unassessed risks and rewards, as we know. Um, uh, the reason why we're so careful about privacy, as I said, we will not cover this because we covered uh, the topic last year. Uh, I might cover it again next year. But it's one of the reasons why privacy is so crucial, at least from a European perspective, is because it's the counterpart of the nature of the self. Uh, privacy in a more American context is linked to a philosophy of economics. Um, it's a matter of what kind of information can I exchange with whom according to what rules and for what, say, uh, uh, convenience or within what constraints. Uh, it has a transactional nature that makes it easier to link the theory of privacy with the philosophy of economics and a, if you like, market-oriented perspective, which is perfectly fine. From a philosophical European perspective, privacy is linked to the philosophy of mind or philosophy of the self. It's linked to uh, human uh, nature, um, human exceptional uh, role uh, in nature, human rights, uh, and human dignity. You can tell why the two sort of frameworks don't really speak uh, the same language. And so sometimes may reach the same conclusion or sometimes may simply uh, disagree completely because they come from two philosophical uh, perspectives. One, philosophy of mind, philosophy of identity, personal identity, privacy, therefore my information as my lungs, my hands, my eyes is what makes me, me. And therefore all the discussion we have today. The other one is my information as in my car, my shoes, um, my house is something that belongs to me and I can uh, use, dispose, uh, limit in terms of usage, etc. Philosophy of economics. I'm not criticizing one or the other. I um, just want to make you aware of this distinction so that you can position yourself more critically and say, well, I'd rather prefer one or the other. You may imagine on which side I sit, um, but I have plenty of respect for, for the other. A philosophy of mind uh, and a philosophy of human dignity seems to me much more robust when it comes to understanding privacy as a human right uh, rather than uh, a philosophy of economics. But as I said, uh, the, these are open questions that remain open. Conclusion, uh, therefore, uh, before the next uh, uh, summary uh, of a slide, um, 
what can and should be done? Well, uh, this is something that we have covered uh, since uh, the beginning of these lectures. Um, there is a sort of ecology, as I told you, uh, theory of what is the self and how does the self change uh, after the digital revolution. More philosophical insight, better understanding, absolutely. That's what we also try to do. I certainly try to do uh, this morning, uh, sharing with you a few ideas. But there's also an ethical uh, part, which is equally important. And so with a bit of a uh, playing with words from ecology to ecology of the self, better ethics, better a way of uh, constructing the self, so self poiesis and some of the editing and writing of the book we are reinterpreting the book we have already written needs to be done way more carefully and at a level that is infinitely more aware of what's going on that I can see around us. Uh, one of the side comments, uh, one of the disappointing aspects uh, as you get old uh, of life as we live it is the amount of leaving that goes unexamined. I mean, this is a cl classic Socratic point, nothing new. We've been saying this for 25 centuries among philosophers, but it's extraordinary how much of our life is um, enjoyed, endured, um, suffered, um, lived without really understanding what's going on. So one of the things that I'm recommending here uh, for the future, and it's part of the ethics uh, uh, of the digital as we develop it, is to be way more careful and therefore way more normative, uh, autonomy, self-regulation, etc., about the construction of the self. But if you remember, there was the old diagram where we were talking about uh, where do you intervene when you do ethical analysis on the sources, on what they do, or on the outcome. In this point, uh, in this particular uh, case, uh, at this point, I'm talking about the agents, how the agents can uh, improve, refine, change themselves. A very brief point, uh, nothing particularly new. Uh, what is new is what happens after the digital revolution, meaning how that develops, how that can be done, and how the technologies that surround us, including the environment, infosphere, hyperhistory on life, all the stuff that we did with the methodology, needs to be shaped and designed so that the ecology and the ecology are easier, friendlier towards the uh, subject. We're almost there. Now, uh, some of the things I'm going to tell you are much less uh, difficult, I hope. Um, we uh, change uh, this uh, transition uh, moment with this hapax legomenon um, uh, from the analysis of the self to the analysis of hope. I like to join these two topics. I could have kept them separate into uh, separate lectures, but I, I see um, a fundamental link between the two. Uh, if we concentrate only uh, take the last two hours and a half and distill only one point among many uh, and we make that point how we um, self-consciously design ourselves, change ourselves. Um, well, we do that in view of uh, a project uh, because of some goals following some particular uh, interest. That is the topic uh, coming after this particular sort of transition uh, um, stage, the hapax legomenon that I'm going to tell you in a moment. But that's why uh, the next uh, part of this lecture is about hope and how technologies, digital ones, are also not just technologies of the self, but also techno hope or technologies that ha hijacked the uh, discourse or the uh, analysis of a hope in the 21st century. But more on this uh, in a few minutes. First of all, an explanation about what this means, hapax legomenon. Um, remember when I gave you that analogy with water and said, well, you can consider yourself, uh, I can consider myself just a drop of water uh, coming from a fountain, going back to the fountain. Uh, those X number of years uh, are just a fraction of, of uh, of a moment for for the drop of water. They last, well, maybe say, 100 years for uh, me, but um, water you are and water you're going to be again. 
metaphorically speaking. Well, this comes from Heraclitus. Uh, this is a very, very famous fragment from Heraclitus. Any philosopher who has done philosophy at all will have heard about the first bits uh, when you never step into the same river uh, because uh, the river is constantly changing. The water is flowing. And this sense of stepping into life when life is constantly changing uh, is one of the alternative views of looking at the uh, reality. Um, Parmenides, the other sort of uh, pre, pre, no, before Socrates, pre-Socratic philosopher, uh, has an almost opposite view. Nothing changes. Being is and can only be. Uh, uh, change is almost, uh, only uh, apparent. Um, it looks like things are changing, but it now nothing ever uh, really makes a move. Now, I find that uh, hardly believable, but uh, there's a whole fundamental, very important, significant metaphysics that takes their view. Alternatively, you can actually think that, no, things change, change all the time. Uh, in fact, change is the essence of our epistemological, ontology, etc., etc. But what I like to stress is uh, it's the continuation of that fragment and other bits of that fragment, which normally you don't find in a textbook. And uh, I like that sentence, it is dead to souls to become water. Well, if you read the one before, uh, if your soul, metaphorically speaking, is made of water, well, if you join the river, you lose your identity. You're no longer that drop of water. You're no longer uh, that tear uh, or tears um, and uh, uh, or that little drop of uh, rain that is on uh, on the window. You join other drops and other drops will join uh, more drops and more water. Um, the disappearance of the self uh, ends up being the disappearance of identity as a detached element from the rest. Uh, it doesn't mean that that drop of water stops existing, uh, but it just becomes part of a much, much larger pool of water. What it is, and goes back to being water. This uh, sort of metaphysics behind the, the picture, um, it reminds us that you know, we can understand ourselves, uh, again, from a, a digital perspective, as a um, moment of resistance against this uniformity of being. Uh, when I told you before uh, the fight against entropy, um, uh, for those of you who want to pursue this uh, way more deeply than we have time here, uh, the, the book called The Ethics of Information is based, uh, published many years ago, is based on this view that basically ethics is an anti-entropic um, effort. Um, our anomaly is to be such points of resistance against, if you like, the pool of water. Um, another metaphor here, uh, very uh, Heraclitean, uh, is to imagine ourselves as whirlpools in the river of reality. If you look at a whirlpool, there is nothing intrinsically something or substantial in that whirlpool. It's a particular pattern in the river of reality. Move a rock or get some more water and that whirlpool will disappear and there will be no such thing as a whirlpool. All this to uh, introduce uh, the view that from uh, this digital revolution and the uh, displacement of ourselves from the center of anything, not the universe, uh, not, uh, not nature, not mental life, not even the informational uh, game, not even the infosphere, we're still quite special. Um, remember I told you that uh, I, uh, at the end of the day, I wasn't giving up on human exceptionalism. I wanted to give up on human centrality. But you can be exceptional by being peripheral, by being at the service of, by being uh, a special, uh, oh, that, the catchphrase here, a beautiful glitch. Um, if we are this beautiful glitch, and by the way, the, what you see there is called uh, glitch art, um, something has been available for a long, long time. I'm particularly attached to that picture. I've used it uh, uh, a million times by now. You might have seen it in videos or, or previous uh, interaction we might have had. Uh, you can see that uh, it's the, uh, it's a probably a portrait or uh, most likely of a woman. Uh, um, this beautiful glitch is, to put it in different terms, uh, more Java-like, I think, uh, is a non-fatal exception. 
anything as weird and uh, dysfunctional as humanity should have been crashed by evolution. Um, in fact, I, you can imagine ourselves as uh, people in this uh, call uh, as halfway between a dog and a mad person. The dog can only be here now, forget about the dreaming, uh, or if you like the spider, uh, or an organism that is totally embedded in terms of interactions, including uh, our average uh, robot, here now interacting uh, with a feedback relationship and an interaction able to make a difference to the world, being affected by those differences, etc., but cannot detach itself from the world. The madman, the person who has completely lost his mind, who believes he's Napoleon, is so detached from the universe that has lost any sense of functional, successful interaction with the world. The, the mad person will try to fly from the no, top floor of a building and kill uh, themselves. We are halfway in between. Uh, in a different context, I was talking to a friend, it's like we are properly toasted. We're not burned like someone who's totally crazy uh, flying from the top uh, floor of a skyscraper, uh, but we're not totally untoasted like uh, a simple organism. We're just at the right distance between detachment and total loss of sensory reality. The detachment enables us to think about the future, for example, uh, being worried about in my case, pension in not 15 years from now. So um, not a worry that any spider has ever had um, or any dog. At the same time, we're not so distant that uh, anything goes and we can just live in our own imagination that our internal model has no relation with the external system. There is enough uh, relationship between the modeling that goes on in our minds and the system and how it works to make us successful non-fatal exception, a successful, not beautiful glitch. As informational organisms, the kind of description that I gave in these lectures, let me remind you that fundamentally, essentially, crucially, this is not what we are intrinsically full stop. Uh, another piece of memory so that this is going to go into a, a whole diary. I remember uh, we were in the 90s and um, giving a lecture uh, in the Netherlands. And start describing, you know, saying, look, I think we need to interpret itself, not information. Is that? And I remember a, a famous, not to be named, um, a famous computer ethicist uh, at the time, actually uh, being um, horrified. Uh, and I will never forget. I mean, I was a, I was a young postdoc uh, saying, you're comparing human beings to numbers. This is like um, Auschwitz. You're putting numbers uh, uh, on people, but we're not numbers. So, a uh, couple of decades later, uh, no, the same person was just not talking about information uh, ethics, how wonderful everything we had been doing, etc. So I changed his mind radically. I never meant, of course, uh, to talk about human nature as intrinsically digital. That would be idiotic. I mean, that is not even worth discussing. Remember, what I'm talking about is if you are modeling that particular system called the self or the I, you, uh, then it is valuable for particular purposes. Now, make sense, understand contemporary uh, reality, what happens to us after the digital revolution, what we want to do, for example, in terms of legislation, uh, for another context, etc. To model that, to understand that at the level of abstraction, which is digital and information, and therefore represents ourselves as information organisms. But we are a gazillion other things. If you read Descartes, for example, at some point, uh, there's a, a post-Cartesian uh, way of describing uh, human beings as um, automata. Certainly dogs, for example, in Descartes, animals have no suffering. They're just as good as mechanisms. Well, that is a level of abstraction. It's the wrong one, as we know, but certainly doesn't mean anything. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the intrinsic nature of a dog. Now, fast forward and humans, instead of being seen as uh, uh, mechanisms, they are seen as uh, biochemical uh, organism only. We are what we eat, a famous uh, sentence that goes around. Well, then again, if you take that uh, literally, uh, that is reductive to a level that is just ludicrous, but yet you know, there is a point there, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm saying here is we are information organism at the level of abstraction adopted in these uh, lectures, which is 
digital, post-digital revolution, uh, and so forth. As such, then the convenience, the value, the fruitfulness of that perspective, or lens, shame on me, or level of abstraction, much better, of seeing our lives and identities as information uh, in themselves, is to realize that they are fragile. This goes against the homo economicus, the economic human being with which we have lived as a model for a good chunk of the past century, shall we say the second half of the 20th century. Uh, Market-oriented, consumeristic, um, sort of capitalist view of humanity and the individual becomes the economic agent, rational, informed, that constantly uh, uh, measures uh, different uh, values and uh, uh, in terms of what is uh, value for money, uh, what pays back, uh, what are the uh, more uh, interesting, uh, more rewarding, uh, more fruitful options and so on. Now that homo economicus, as I said, uh, uh, economic, uh, homo means man, but economic person, um, it was a fiction and it was not such a good model. Uh, it certainly was a, an overstretch. And Herbert Simon onwards, Herbert Simon is the Nobel laureate, uh, philosophy economist, uh, also very influential in AI and uh, the philosophy of design. Herbert uh, Simon onwards, we have abandoned that big picture. We have started talking about uh, limited rationality, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, these days, uh, we all know uh, about how much uh, all other things, including emotions, uh, who we think we are, how much we think we know, et cetera, et cetera, influence our behavior. So that model had to go away, but that model was informationally strong. The idea was that the individual as a rational agent had the information, the ability, the processing power to make the right decisions at every corner. Uh, we weren't going to in inquire about how fragile, influenceable, malleable, uh, in fact, crashable that individual was. When you get an economic model of privacy, I fear, not so sure, but I hear an echo of that sort of economic man, homo economicus, and that rationality, that ability to uh, be in charge of your destiny because you know everything, you know how to calculate, et cetera, et cetera. I'd rather have a more realistic view and consider the self as informationally fragile and therefore in need of protection. That protection comes from a better ethics and a better legislation. For that reason, um, one way of uh, presenting this is in terms of that special word or expression that I introduced uh, some time ago, the hapax legomenon. This, for those of you who have done some classics, is trivial, um, so let me uh, go rather quickly. Um, as I remind you uh, in the past, um, uh, it's an expression used in philology to indicate a word that does not occur more than once in a corpus of um, text or uh, it could be a book, could be a whole uh, production of uh, a, a writer. Um, the example that I give there, uh, skufos, um, sorry, uh, uh, that's written in Greek, but uh, um, it's, um, it's the drinky cup uh, that uh, is offered to Odysseus when Odysseus uh, reaches um, uh, Ithaca and uh, is talking to his former servant, uh, Emmaus. That word never occurs again, ever, anywhere in the Odyssey. It's just a fact. There's nothing magic about it, nothing special, but it is exceptional. This is the sense of exceptionality that I would like to convey uh, during the lectures. Exceptional doesn't mean supernatural. It doesn't mean magic, it doesn't mean miraculous, it just means once in a lifetime. Humanity, in my view, is exceptional in that sense. Once in a lifetime of this universe, the beautiful glitch has happened. The fact that it has happened, we reason a posteriori after it has happened, and we find it absolutely extraordinary. But no, we're just the uh, lottery winners. Uh, wouldn't you find it extraordinary to have won the lottery after you have actually uh, won it? So 
back to the metaphors whether we have used uh, to start this uh, analysis of what is the nature of reality. Remember Galileo's Book of Nature? Well, not only we're we writing that Book of Nature, but there's something that is written in that Book of Nature, and that's us. So humanity, as that super special word in Galileo's Book of Nature, is an hapax of the dominant. At least as far as we know, and at least until we get uh, other proofs that uh, this is not the case, and there might be other hapax of the domina, uh, elsewhere in this very, very vast universe, um, who knows, one day we might get a radio signal um, uh, from a far, far distant galaxy. But so far, uh, that's the only um, sort of uh, kind of uh, mental existence that we are aware of in this whole empty space. More consequences of what uh, is coming out of this analysis. The human project, something that we will cover towards the end of these lectures, clearly needs to be friendly towards the beautiful glitch and its world. And it needs to be friendly in, a, in that fragile sense we, we have seen before. If this sounds once again too philosophical, one more uh, simple example. The difference between enabling and empowering someone. If you empower someone, be careful about the trick. Empowering means also shifting the responsibility for what is happening. If I empower with, for example, taking care of my house, then if something goes wrong, it's your fault because you weren't empowered. If I enable you to take care of my house, well, if something goes wrong, it might be that I was careless, but you were just enabled. You could have, but if you didn't, it wasn't because you were in charge. If this again sounds, once again, too philosophical, uh, down to NHS uh, and the debate about um, the uh, use of digital um, tools. This is a work that we've done with a colleague, uh, Amis, uh, and my colleague, uh, uh, Jess uh, Marley. If you go down the road of, or oh, NHS is the National Health Service in, in England, um, if the National Ser uh, Health Service of a country uh, stresses too much the empowering uh, of digital technologies, be careful, because what they are doing, whether they know it or not, it doesn't matter, is also shifting the burden of responsibility when things don't happen. If I empower you to run, say, a blood test every X number of months or years, and you don't do it, oh, I can wash my hands. I empower you, it was your responsibility. Something goes wrong, it's your fault. If I enable you to do that, it means that the responsibility that things should go and happen as they should is still mine. It's just you have the option of doing it if you wish. So the kind of technologies that are friendly to the beautiful glitch, that are respectful of the fragility of the beautiful glitch, are enabling rather than empowering. I hope that this doesn't go unnoticed in terms of actual specific policies. Let me give you another example uh, from the past. Uh, this is well known, it's everywhere, uh, and it's a long time ago, uh, not uh, sort of uh, breaching any uh, non disclosure agreement. There was a, a super famous social platform many, many years ago that was discussing, um, uh, we were in Brussels, and the problem was uh, there are plenty of uh, underage people on your platform. We need to stop that. The platform was arguing that it wasn't its fault, it was too easy, etc. So the platform uh, proposed uh, to empower parents. Now that's a nice trick. Uh, if something goes wrong, say if Peter or Mary and the age is on their platform, you have empowered the uh, parents. Whose fault is that? The parents. They have the tools, the know-how, the checking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I was among the ones who developed now the argument, saying, "Look, don't confuse enabling with empowering." Blah blah blah. If you have a kid buying, say, alcohol under age in uh, in England, uh, you may blame the parents, but the shop is in trouble. And that is exactly what we need to do here. If I actually that line pass, and in theory at least, um, the the platforms now is responsible for uh, the underage presence of kids there, not the parents. But that was exactly the enabling and empowering. The parents should be enabled to check, double check, and making making uh, things right as much as they can, but not empower in that sense of shifting responsibility. 
Fast forward almost uh, 15 years later, same argument with OpenAI and the Italian uh, authority that block the use of OpenAI essentially in Italy. The argument, among many others, was that uh, there were uh, underage people using the service, that OpenAI had to do something about it. Enabling parents, absolutely, uh, as much as you want. Empowering so that they are the ones responsible for blocking the kids to be online, I don't think so. In fact, in the end, uh, today, in a very minimal and sort of more box ticking that we want to have, another discussion for another day, but at least the logic uh, of the argument uh, is right. It's open AI that is in charge and not shifting the burden of responsibility, empowering the agents, etc. So protect the fragility of the agents, be respectful uh, and friendly towards the beautiful glitch, that is part of the human project, but we will see this at the end of the lectures, not towards the end. A few questions uh, just open and then we move on. This will lead us too far away uh, and I want to stay on course. And I've already expanded and uh, uh, branched out uh, too many times. But one question that becomes obvious is whether the digital age will change our conception experience of uh, the other. The whole discussion today for the past three hours or so has been about the self. But the sense of the other, as I told you, is um, coming back uh, with vengeance. If modernity is the sense of the I, the self, the me, 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 uh, the centrality one way or another, fighting for some centrality of the I, whether you know, cosmological, uh, uh, natural, mental, informational, etc. Well, their age, if anything, has come to an end. It means that we are at a stage where uh, the ultimate other, the real other, not other as in another part of humanity, but something that is not human and presents itself as something completely different from, and I told you, is either nature or God or both, uh, essentially, uh, will the digital change our conception and experience of this other, and I should have put uh, the O as capital, plenty of work to do here, but uh, not for today. Um, will the same kind of discussion uh, expand, shrink, modify the horizon of transcendence, what we think is of it and above ourselves? Once again, philosophy cannot avoid talking about uh, the uh, ultimate nature of things, uh, including God, transcendence, etc. We are here for this reason. There is no other place where you can postpone this discussion. Um, if you are working in physics, you can say, oh, this is a philosophical issue. If you are uh, um, in a you know, biological, uh, chemical uh, context in, in, in a different departments, you can delegate, um, shift the burden. But once you do philosophy, <laughs> there is no other place where to sort of uh, move this kind of difficulties. Um, I don't want to uh, discuss it uh, during these lectures. Uh, I hope it will be a topic for next year. Uh, but I'm deeply curious to understand what is the impact of this digital revolution, which is changing our conception of reality and our conception of ourselves also not only on the conception of the other, but also in terms of do we have a fully, totally, 100% um, imminent way of making sense of our lives, or, and it's a real or, trust me, uh, I speak as an agnostic, neither one side nor the other, uh, or is there a need to understand much better, even just theoretically, whether the way of pushing the limit or what is the source of the ultimate sense of life is modified by this digital revolution. Um, discussions with uh, people who are believers uh, um, shows me that uh, uh, there are different camps, some horrified, some super enthusiastic, uh, some in incredibly naive, some others um, uh, a bit apocalyptic. Uh, but more on this, uh, I hope, uh, next year uh, for the next course. And finally, um, the topic that uh, you know, comes from the other two, the other transcendence and therefore us, this immanent semantics. Uh, can finally the digital age make available a fully immanent semantics, full stop, where this 
constant uh, residue of there must be more, there is more. Um, surely something elsewhere uh, is completed, avoided, uh, made sense of. A sort of atheist humanism, uh, uh, or I would rather call it a spiritual humanism, but without a God. So um, where spirituality is kept in place, uh, but there is no need to postpone, delegate, create an alternative, which then, as the other, feeds back semantics to this particular world from the outside. Open question again. More on this another day, because I want to touch uh, the um, uh, topic of hope um, uh, with you. I know that we had covered quite a lot, uh, so maybe um, this is a good point to uh, stop for a moment, ask whether there are any questions, and if not, we continue, but otherwise, uh, if there are any questions on what we covered so far, this uh, could be a, a good moment. I think everybody's quiet, so maybe we can keep going. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah, OK, good. Um, so um, thank you for no, being still there. Uh, and simplifying a lot, nature of reality, nature of the self, impact of digital technologies on both. Basically, that's all we did uh, in all these hours. Uh, when it comes to impact on the self, one among many other important topics, but it's one that is significant, is how the self constructs itself in view of a project. Normally, that project has two engines. I'll show you in a moment. Interest and hope. They're compatible sometimes, sometimes they're not. But that's the topic that we're going to discuss. To understand it, we need to take some steps as a kind of a runner up to the topic. So bear with me, and uh, this is very much post lunch, um, as you can tell. So this, uh, I, I'm sure you can find a lot of uh, other uh, similar advertisements. Um, this one says that uh, if they don't have chocolate in heaven, I'm not going. Uh, and I can sympathize with that quite a lot. Let me give you a few more advertisements and then whether you can see anything here that is sort of uh, the constant. Well, rest assured, they have chocolate heaven's bar. So we can go to heaven because they have chocolate even in heaven. In fact, they have paradise supreme, uh, no, brownies in heaven. Uh, lots of chocolate, lots of heaven. They even have you know, divinely chocolately cookies. Uh, I got one of this uh, served by British Airways while, uh, while I was writing a paper on which these lectures are based, Technologies of Hope. I couldn't believe myself. In fact, I, I thought it was almost spooky, honestly. I was literally working on these slides and this lady came with this divinely chocolately cookies and I thought someone up there is playing a very bad joke. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, but no, as we know, uh, chocolate can also be kind of sinful. Uh, and uh, no, there is a, a road that leads all the way to uh, that sort of hell razor, milk chicle, etc. Et so why am I telling you before I know all this about chocolate heaven and hell? Um, the constant here is the following. And I hope the coffee after lunch was strong because uh, I need you to stretch a little bit in your mind, not much, but a little bit. When new sciences or scholarly subjects emerge in the history of humanity, <laughs> it takes a while for them to become a discipline. That discipline normally has a few founding mothers or fathers, uh, a lot of fa uh, fathers and some mothers. Um, needs a vocabulary, a technical vocabulary. The standard way of doing uh, that search is by looking around and see who's, who has the technical vocabulary I can borrow so that my discipline can start with the right vocabulary. Let me put it like here, so that's a bit less disturbing. <coughs> um, when 
sociology developed and political science as disciplines, they didn't know where to go because the you know, robust sciences around weren't quite the same. Remember, um, sociology, political science, they belong to the social sciences. And if you remember from the other day when I told you, look, there are two ways of looking at causality. One is the cause and effect, but the other one is when something happens because you want to reach a particular goal, the teleological, telos from Greek, the goal um, analysis. So you can say uh, why uh, Luciano went to, uh, went to have a, a glass of water. And you can say, uh, for example, because you were thirsty, thirsty, and it can build a whole cause and effect about me not having enough so hydration, etc., needing more liquid, and so on. Or you could have a completely different explanation. It says, well, he had a glass of water as opposed to a coke because he wants to keep, uh, you know, uh, careful uh, in terms of in in intake of calories. Perfectly two explanations: one causal, mechanical, if you like; the other one teleological. In social sciences, we use quite a lot of teleological uh, explanations. The what for explains why they happen. Uh, I hope you also remember Kant, the discussion, the, the conditions of possibility, the systems, Hegel, the conditions of equilibrium, Hegel, more social sciences, Kant, more sciences of nature. It all, I hope, makes sense. Why all this? Because when social sciences started emerging, especially sociology, uh, much later political science and uh, economics, the teleological science around was theology, literally. And therefore, the vocabulary, this is a classic analysis of social sciences, was kind of borrowed gently and kindly from theology in terms, for example, of theory of power, or theory of ends and goals, of organization, and so on. Fast forward, and uh, there are other disciplines emerging. As disciplines emerge, they borrow vocabulary from previous disciplines. <coughs> As I said, it's a, it's, it's a recurrent pattern. The vocabulary, therefore, of, um, say, heaven and hell, as you can tell, today is completely not appropriated by something that with hell and, uh, and paradise uh, has got nothing uh, to do. Uh, the marketing of chocolate, no, just to give you a, a simple uh, example. Uh, the sinful, the paradise, the heavenly, and so on. We find it normal, but it wasn't normal in the past. It has gone through the whole transition of grasping their vocabulary, making it you know, uh, technical, and then from that, the technical vocabulary of a different disciplines, further no, sh sort of shifting it down the road of marketing. So oversimplifying the sinful here from a technical term in theology to a slightly kind of technical term in sociology to a slightly technical terms in marketing. One, two, three, and you get the kind of change. I'll tell you much more and much more precisely and less metaphorically uh, in a couple of slides. But this shift happens also in other contexts. A paper I haven't written, but I hope to write, and one uh, which I hope to write with Kia, uh, my wife, he's uh, the neuroscientist. If you look at the two disciplines of um, AI and neuroscience, it's remarkable to see what has happened. When AI emerges, there is no vocabulary for that kind of agency. Remember, we, it's not an organism. It's not a natural force, it's not like a river, it's not like a dog, it's not like a human being. And yet, it's something that does something to something else and changes its behavior according to what the something has actually achieved, feedback and so on. So where do I go if not around the corner and borrow from hum human psychology, anthropology, etc., the vocabulary? So all the terminology that you find, uh, which is quite funny, uh, in computer science, but especially in AI, is whole anthropomorphic for a reason. New discipline, new technical vocabulary, I go around and I borrow from my neighbor. All the way to uh, chat GPT having some hallucinations. Bingo. Once again, we're borrowing a term which is highly technical 
and has a completely different meaning to describe something that was vaguely related, but not really, uh, you know, statistical invented bits of uh, uh, information to complete, uh, say, a sentence. Uh, of course, ChatGPT doesn't have hallucination in any possible way. Of course, chocolate is not sinful in any possible religious sense, uh, I believe. <laughs> uh, um, but that is the kind of transition that has happened. So AI speaks the vocabulary. Uh, we speak about memory, perception, learning, unlearning, all keywords that have a technical, very specific meaning in more anthropocentric or anthropological disciplines in social sciences. So. Here is computer science and AI borrowing from the neighbor. Neuroscience emerges. Neuroscience needs to speak about the brain as some kind of mechanism, gently speaking, but a mechanism it is. All of a sudden, it seems natural to talk about the brain as something that is processing information with input and output and a clock, et cetera, et cetera. The vocabulary of uh, neuroscience is completely borrowed from computer science. Full mess, these days, when you hear people talking about is AI going to be conscious intelligence and so on, remember that these two borrowing from the two disciplines are making a total mess of what we're speaking about. AI has been borrowing from, uh, since the beginning, you know, uh, in the uh, roughly 50s, um, uh, even earlier, uh, but no, with science fiction, so, but say 50s onwards, from anthropomorphic vocabulary. So clearly it gives you an impression that, you now if ChatGPT writes uh, or thinks or you know, perceives or understands, well, keep using those words, and all of a sudden uh, you start anthropomorphizing ChatGPT. Meanwhile, the neuroscience talks about the brain as something that is, you know, uh, is a uh, neural network that has thresholds and input and output and etc. It's all computational. So if the brain is a computer and ChatGPT is almost anthropomorphized, clearly at some point the two things must be the same thing. For anyone who doesn't know how this has happened. Don't ask forgiveness for the chocolate you have had is not sinful uh, and don't think you're going to go to heaven because you ate that bar of uh, chocolate. Likewise, uh, do not get confused when anthropomorphic vocabulary in AI is being used. It's just OK, as long as we know what we're doing. And don't get confused when computational vocabulary is borrowed by neuroscience, as long as we know what we're doing. Um, it's comp uh, comparable to and that's the end of this particular note, and then we start talking about something else, comparable to the following two expressions, which I find always quite funny, and I use them too often. Sorry about the uh, repetition. No one in his right mind should ever look for how many horses are in an engine when you speak about horse power, HP. HP equal horse power because the only vocabulary we had when we invented the cars was the vocabulary of horses. And cars started being compared to, oh, this has the power of two, four, six, a thousand, or whatever number is of horses. Of course, it's metaphorical. Uh, so ChatGPT is intelligent in the same sense in which an engine has horse power. Don't look for the horses. Or, as I hope AI one day will be interpreted in the future, and more on this when we do the right lecture. Even these days, after all those four revolutions, we'll still talk about the sun rising. Of course, the sun doesn't go anywhere, uh, or at least not within uh, the frame of reference of our solar system. But the sun rises belongs to a time when the vocabulary was shaped by the centrality of the Earth. The Earth was at the center of the universe and the sun was going around it. The sun rises and goes here and goes there, but it's the Earth, of course, that moves, not the sun. Obviously, that is a metaphorical way of speaking. No one looks for the actual movement uh, of the sun, um, luckily. Uh, I hope one day you know, AI will be treated in the same way. No one will be start looking for the intelligence in the AI uh, in the same way as there is no horsepower actual horses in the engine or the sun moving around uh, one way or another. But why all this? Um, because 
the vocabulary of hope has gone through the same kind of process. The vocabulary of hope is a typical theological, especially in Western Christian theology term. It's a technical term. This is where it has its major formulation. I'll tell you more about this particular uh, piece. It's from uh, Paul of Tarsus, also known as St. Paul, letter to the Corinthians, um, where <coughs> he uh, lists the theological virtues, and there are three. Faith, hope, and charity. Now, this is super famous, uh, it's been discussed and studied for a gazillion uh, times. Um, uh, I put there the Greek for those of you who are curious, uh, because the kind of hope that he's talking about is that el peace, um, the uh, little word there in red. You may mean uh, hope in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, I'll tell you more in a moment. Some people get confused between faith and hope, for example, but not Paul, uh, who's a great, great, great theologian, um, great intellectual, and distinct he distinguishes the three. Footnote about theology, and then we go on. Um, Paul is very careful about faith, hope, and charity. Uh, he says that of the three, the only one that really matters is charity, uh, because the other two, faith and hope, will disappear once you're dead. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, once you're dead, you meet God, and you don't have to have faith. God will be present. You don't have to have hope in the future, in an afterlife. Yeah, you are there, but you will still have charity. I mean, this sense of um, communal, sharing, loving, tender attitude towards all that surrounds you. God participating in uh, God's love uh, is a difficult word to um, translate. The Greek there I mean, is agape and uh, it's has so nothing to do with love as in, say, more uh, sexually oriented, uh, more terrestrial. Um, sometimes the translation has uh, faith, hope and love, but uh, love is a bit of a difficult um, word. Charity doesn't quite translate it. Agape probably is uh, better kept uh, for its meaning. But we know here for a theology lecture, our philosophy of religion, uh, we need, we're here to discuss technology as hope. What has happened with, it, uh, with this particular term? It used to be a theological, 100% technical term. It is crucial because, as I told you, the uh, human motivation has this kind of two engines. Man, here's the picture, and I uh, uh, hope it will stay with you in your mind. Interest and hope. Interest, um, the distinction between interest, um, you can use the two words in, interchangeably, uh, of course. But the difference here is that interest normally is self-interest. What's in it for me, basically? Hope can be also um, a matter of um, altruistic or non-interest oriented. If I hope that the world will be a better place in a thousand years, uh, that I have no interest uh, of a personal kind. If I hope that you will have a good time, um, again, uh, nothing to do with uh, something in it for me. Uh, we need to dis define hope much better, and I will in a moment, but you can see that interest and hope are quite separate. Interest and hope uh, have therefore different discourses. The economic uh, discourse starts by appropriating the analysis of interest. It is not accidental that today, if you discuss any kind of interest, why do you have an interest? Uh, the mind immediately sort of starts being uh, attracted by some kind of gain, um, pro and contra, equilibrium, trade-off, um, what's in it for me, essentially an economic uh, uh, analysis. The economic discourse is then appropriated by technology. We will not pursue this particular line, but today, the technology discourse appropriates the economic analysis of interest because economy is above all digital economy. So here's a quick round now, as far as interest and we will have the same kind of pattern for hope, which is what we want to pursue. So this is just to close this particular analysis of one of the two engines. Human motivations, interest and hope. Interest, fundamentally an economic analysis. But that appropriation, economically speaking, of any kind of interest, which is not said and not necessarily the case, but no, that's, shall we say, uh, given, is then appropriated by technology in terms of 
what kind of interest uh, are we talking about when we talk about economic interest? So interest become economic interest and economic interest becomes techno economy interest. Today is no, basically linked to what happens when Apple says so or doesn't say so, that kind of interest. So economic interest discourse, techno discourse, that's one of the engine. The other engine, as I show you before with Paul, etc., hope is appropriated by uh, the religious uh, discourse at some point. If you like, you can pick up uh, Paul of Tarsus as the pivotal moment when any discussion about hope becomes a discussion of some sort of religious uh, interpretation of that hope. As I told you, we don't have an analysis of hope yet, but it's coming in a moment. Uh, and then uh, probably we have to stop after that for some Q&A. Later on, it is the political discourse that appropriates the religious analysis of hope. So uh, in Marx, for example, hope has got nothing to do with the afterlife, but everything to do with the so emancipation uh, the, uh, of uh, working class, the reappropriation of the means of production, the end of um, oops, some some uh, mic, uh, the the end of uh, um, uh, alienation and so on. Fast forward and the argument. So I think that what I'm telling you so far is kind of non-controversial, not debatable, but uh, the problem is with anyone who disagrees, more open to questioning, and that's the thesis I'm suggesting, is that later, uh, roughly since the digital revolution onwards, shall we say in the last you know, few decades, it is the technology discourse that has appropriated the political analysis of hope. So talking about the technologies of the self, in line with techno hope makes a single package. So this is what the sort of two engines look like today, at least for someone like me. Interest. First economic discourse, then techno discourse. Hope. Was religious discourse, becomes political discourse, today is techno discourse. So at the end of the day, is techno discourse when it comes to interest and hope. Of course, this is a bit of a simplification. I'm not taking into account a gazillion other sort of uh, ways of looking at the world. Uh, just be mindful of other cultures where religion has not been appropriated by technology yet. So I'm talking about probably you know some uh, rich Western uh, uh, global north, et cetera, et cetera, some kind of culture. But I think it captures that sense of um, uh, utopian thinking, which I hope we'll see at the end of this uh, course uh, in the following uh, uh, lectures, where any utopian thinking today is profoundly digital, techno-digital, interest and hope. And it wasn't like that in the past, it didn't have to be. Classics in utopian thinking from uh, Plato to Moore, etc., have nothing to do with technology, almost no matter whether the technology is local or not, not, not windmills, no, no slaves, no, it's not about that. It's about the ideal city, the ideal society in which we want to live, the ideal relationship that we want to have. Today, if you ask anyone down the road, say, what's the utopian world? It is plenty of technology mm -hmm. and not much about you know, the sort of society that, in fact, when it comes to thinking in terms of relations, social, socio-political, so on. It becomes I hope to have mute uh, everybody but myself. Um, uh, uh, just looking at, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Amy. So this um, view of uh, the progressive appropriation of some discourses of technical terms, uh, by in mind that there's also nothing intrinsically wrong. That's, that's the way in which new disciplines, new changes in our society and culture progress. Once again, we need to be careful. So I will ignore from now on uh, that side of uh, the other engine. I will concentrate only on hope, but I hope, hope that, uh, sorry, uh, bad joke, uh, that uh, the same analysis could be developed for interest. So what we need to address, and uh, I'll ask you to give me another five minutes and then we stop and we have some Q&A. Um, 
we need to understand what hope is, uh, have a bit of a definition, then how has the technology discourse appropriated the religious analysis of hope, and in case, how can hope be reappropriated? So these are uh, essentially the topics for the rest uh, of the next five minutes and for tomorrow morning. <clears throat> I told you that so far, uh, I wanted to make sure that you would have a, a intuitive sense of a difference between interest and hope. I also told you that the two words can be used uh, interchangeably sometimes. Uh, there's something more altruistic about hope. <coughs> but above all, we do have, luckily, and I'll tell you what those little symbols mean uh, at the bottom, we do have a classic analysis of hope. And for once, philosophers actually agree, uh, pretty much all of them. Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, Aquinas, sorry, Hobbes, Hume, they see hope as a two components uh, something. It's about what you believe and it's about what you want or you like or you uh, desire. This is how you read this little formula here, uh, which for anyone who has done a bit of mathematical uh, logic is trivial, uh, and for those of you who haven't, will become trivial in a second. <coughs> this thing here says that A, call A Alice, our agent, hopes, capital H, that P is the case. For example, that she's going to win the lottery. No, this is all this says here. Alice hopes that she's going to win the lottery, if and only if, that's the double arrow. This double arrow means that if this is the case, then this is the case. And if this is the case, uh, then this is the case. You can read, in other words, this quote-unquote equation is an equation. It doesn't mean that they're the same. It means that they are a double implication from left to right and from right to left. Double implication, Alice hopes that P, if and only if, Alice, the same Alice all over the place, desires that P. That's important. You don't hope for something you don't desire. <clears throat> If you don't like desire, you can put a wish, uh, but no, that kind of uh, uh, earnest uh, uh, approach to some something like, so she desires to win the lottery, and that's the little symbol here, Alice believes that P is probable. To be specified in the future, more on the asterisks, but for the moment, just ignore the asterisks, and just uh, read this, Alice believes that she is going to leave the she's going to win the lottery has a probability the probability has to be different from zero it could be one uh, but then you don't really talk about hope you talk about certainty um suppose you have already won the lottery if you have already won the lottery you can't believe that you're going to win the lottery with some probability because you have so the probability here is one. If you have not bought the ticket, it will be irrational, idiotic really, uh, to hope that you're going to win the lottery. You didn't buy the ticket. So the probability of you, you know, winning the lottery, I hope you don't believe that you do because the probability uh, of you winning the lottery is zero. Now. This P here, therefore, there's a bit of the asterisk, is anything between zero and one, excluding both zero and one. That's what hope is. So Alice hopes that P, if and only if, Alice desires that P, and Alice believe that there is a probability different from zero and one, or in between, but excluding zero and one, that P is going to happen. This means that P is a degree of uh, uncertainty. She does not know that she's going to win the lottery. Knowledge requires certainty. You don't know that you win the lottery. I mean, there are so many movies where, uh, quite annoying, and I watch too much Netflix for this. Um, <coughs> speaking of sinful uh, chocolate uh, as well. Uh, when one of, the, one of the characters at some point says, oh no, uh, it's the end of the world, and the other guy says, oh, I promise everything's going to be fine. And quite rightly, the other guy says, oh, the other guy says, you can't promise anything. It's not in your power to promise that it's not the end of the world. Um, or 
the reply comes and it says, you don't know that. Well, that's that's correct. You cannot know something unless that something is true, the case, certain. You can know that that is uncertain, but it's a different story. Um, so there is any probability between and excluding zero and one, I don't remember. So it excludes the impossibility and the certainty. So if one hopes that P, one believes that it is possible that the desired state P obtains. That's another way of saying that's what hope is. Why it is so important to distinguish these two components? Well, first of all, I'll just show you, it's part of the lectures, to show you what uh, conceptual analysis looks like. You have a concept, you distinguish that from uh, interest, you concentrate that, and then you unpack what is in that concept. In this case, we finally reach two components. Okay, there's a design, there's a probability, there's a belief. I can play with these components. I could go even further, of course. We stop here because we have an intuitive sense of D and B, but belief too is also something that needs to be analyzed. But you can keep going. We just decided that this is the granularity that we need for the job that we need to have. Because, oh sorry, this is actually, by, by the way, is, uh, is coherent with what uh, uh, Paulo Tasso says, but because, uh, going back here, the appropriation of the discourse about hope, the appropriation of this, Alice hopes that P, if we are correct, and if this, if and only if component one and component two, it means that we can analyze the appropriation of the discourse about hope as an appropriation of the discourse about desire and the discourse about belief which is exactly, I think, what happens uh, later. Let me stop here because it's already late, but what is going to happen uh, tomorrow is that we will continue the analysis of this, um, uh, the techno appropriation of the discourse about hope. I'll show you how it works, uh, hopefully also with some examples, and then we will move on uh, towards the end of the lecture, uh, trying to link this to the following topics. But I'll stop here and see whether there are any questions uh, on what I covered uh, today. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. One yes. comment in the chat. Go ahead. Yep. Um, I chat. guess relating to when we're talking about um, hope and religion. Uh, Lena says, I hope I rely on God to make things happen, so it is not my responsibility, and when I'm interested, I put the responsibility on myself to accomplish what I want. Could this be the difference? Um, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, part of the difficulty is um, the contextual meaning that some words acquire. Um, the way I've used uh, hope uh, and, and interest uh, is what philosophers would call propositional, meaning that you hope that this is the case. But you can also hope or have an interest in something. So um, it is no longer propositional. Um, and so one could say, look, I, I don't hope that God exists. I hope my hope is in God, for example. Or um, I, uh, I don't have an interest that uh, you're going to do well uh, for your next exam. I have an interest in you. Uh, so this is not the way we have been using uh, interest and hope uh, in these lectures. Um, uh, I think it's uh, perfectly fine and uh, uh, it, it leads to different analysis. Um, there is a tendency, uh, so the question is important because it, it highlights more assumptions. Um, there's a tendency to transform propositional attitudes addressing entities into fully propositional attitudes. So, for example, I believe in you transform into, I believe that you are an honest person, that you are going to do the right thing, that you are going to tell me uh, if there's any problem, that you are going to be a real friend, etc., etc. So 
the what we mean by I believe in you gets translated into a propositional content, which then we can analyze more easily. So in terms of unpacking, um, point number one, words, uh, technical terms get contextual meaning. Uh, some words like interest or uh, hope uh, have uh, a value uh, that tends to be um, propositional. There is a good reason to do that translation uh, so that uh, instead of uh, say, I believe in you, I write, I believe that you will do the right thing, for example. If that is the case, uh, then uh, um, the suggestion there is really not quite uh, on, on, on the spot. Um, uh, we could easily say the opposite. Uh, if I, I uh, have uh, uh, hope uh, that something uh, is going to happen, the rational thing to have is that I make sure that all the conditions for that to happen actually are there. Remember, if I hope to win the lottery ticket, <laughs> I need to buy the lottery ticket. I need to put myself in such circumstances that that hope is rational. And the rationality of that hope is largely insofar it is up to me is to make sure or say I hope to pass the exam how well just by being lucky uh, I'm not going to study anything and no, they will ask me just the right question I will know uh, accidentally boom and I take no uh, credit that's not a plan <laughs> that's an irrational hope so um, yes no we can use the vocabulary as we wish um, and that's not a concession that is a matter of fact but I will be careful, and that's not the way we've been using it in uh, uh, in the previous slides. So I would uh, distinguish what has been said in that question from what I've uh, suggested. Okay, we have a question from the room. Aha! Thank hi, you. <laughs> hi, it's Julia, and I just want to know if you think that we were ourselves were always being influenced by technology not just by digital technology? Um, I think so. Uh, I think that this has uh, increased uh, enormously as technology becomes more and more powerful and um, present in our lives. Uh, the influence of technology on the self has become uh, even more present, both in the sense of changing the self and in the sense of changing our thinking about the self. Let me give you um, uh, a famous example. Um, when Leibniz, the philosopher, uh, roughly we're talking about just uh, around Descartes' time, uh, just just uh, slightly later. I mean, Leibniz has is this, it lives at the same time as Newton. I mean, they have a famous discussion, if you remember, from calculus and so on. When Leibniz needs to explain explain uh, what metaphorically uh, what the mind, what uh, the the thinking uh, process is, he compares that to a um, mill. I can't remember if it's a windmill or a water mill, but a mill is. And he says, in a mill something comes in it gets processed and something gets out you could have some kind of um, uh, seeds processing and some kind of flower comes out and he says that's that's us we get input sensory input etc we process all these thoughts come out technology a hundred percent technological view of what thinking looks like of course you can do all the, only that much with a, with a windmill um, in terms of conceptualizing our uh, personal identity, our way of thinking, mind, self, depending on the topic. But as technology becomes more powerful and present, it will increase its sort of uh, ability to shape ourselves and make us understand ourselves in terms of the current technology. I think in the past there was much less uh, of that, uh, but I'm sure that uh, uh, for a bit of a historical reconstruction, it would be um, both interesting and fun to go through the history of, say, philosophy and look at what kind of technology philosophers have compared ourselves to in order to make sense of ourselves and build ourselves and modify ourselves. The moment you have, uh, as I told you before, I don't know, mechanical clocks and so on, there you go. I mean, the mind is a mechanical clock with gears and uh, uh, weights and so on. So um, as we develop technology, this is becoming more and more present, but it has always been around because uh, it's, it's so convenient. Remember the chariot, 
that is a technology that's Plato, and is still already comparing the self to a chariot with a charioteer, two horses, all the you know, entities that required a chariot. It is is the best technology he could find at the time to make sense of the self. So I would say yes, but in a sort of more encompassing, inclusive uh, process as we you know, move ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first is for reading recommendations about today's topics. Um, Which I'm happy to compile. Yeah, uh, I'll, uh, I'll dig it up. I'm not sure I have uh, one paper on uh, um, uh, this one, Technology Just Hope. Uh, I think it's still a work in progress, but I'll find out if, uh, if I have one, I'll put it there. Let me write this down. Yep, thank you. And then we have a comment from Paula. Uh, humans, we can, so we do. Then if the consequences are bad, maybe we're going to fix it, but it's not our fault. We were made fati non foste a viver come bruti, ma perseguir virtute e conoscenza. Which meaning of conoscenza? There's a lot of... Uh, okay. A multilingual question here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Apologies to all the Italians for my uh, pronunciation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, OK, so uh, trying to understand, uh, make sure that I don't misunderstand the question. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, uh, speak Italian or not from an Italian culture, that is a famous uh, um, so high school level. Everybody knows that sentence uh, in Italy uh, is from uh, Dante and is when Odysseus is uh, uh, talking and uh, to Dante and he says, look, we were not made to live like animals but we were made to follow virtue and, and knowledge. Uh, and you can tell Dante, uh, although he doesn't put uh, Odysseus in paradise, uh, he cannot. I mean, Odysseus predates uh, Jesus, so uh, he's damned, etc. But he has a lot of admiration for uh, Odysseus and, the, and, of course, Homer, etc. So this phrase, uh, like, we were not made to live like brutes, like animals, but to pursue uh, virtue and knowledge, um, <clears throat> That's what the quote um, there is. But I want to concentrate on the first bit. Um, we can and then we do. Um, uh, that is very much the description of the unreflective life. Uh, what I was <laughs> complaining about uh, this morning, um, that is exactly what happens. Uh, we can do something, we do something, and then we think afterwards. It doesn't mean that that is what we should be doing and doesn't mean that we cannot do otherwise uh, or taking one even one class in philosophy should teach anyone at least that much think before doing even if you can do that it doesn't mean that you should um, and if you recall uh, from past lectures uh, I, I stress the importance of understanding that the should requires the can now, if you should do something uh, well, then it, the presupposition is that you can do that something. Uh, if you should, uh, say, jump out of the <laughs> uh, window, uh, well, you should be able to do that. Um, I cannot ask you something uh, to do something morally without presupposing that you can do that uh, in the first place. Normally, when people are asked something too uh, much or that goes beyond their abilities, that's called the supererogatory uh, problem, which just another word technical to say it is asking too much of me. So should presupposes can. That's the stable, not normal assumption in any ethical analysis. What the question is uh, highlighting is that can by itself should not lead to do without any consideration of what's going on here. Now, this is Ethics 101. I mean, uh, anyone who has uh, uh, failed to think about the consequences and the value of their actions uh, is either doing something uh, by default unthinkingly or not already known to be uh, without any negative premises or is insane. Um, so I take that question as a reminder of the importance of thinking before acting, uh, of course, on a side, uh, remembering that any should presupposes uh, a can. We're almost running out of time, but maybe we'll have time for another question, perhaps? Yes, there were a couple in the chat. Um, one, one more in the chat. Uh, question about the vocabulary shift topic. 
when it happens, for example, in science research, it comes with implications. Uh, the conceptual system has a framing power. It obscures certain aspects and highlights others. If the vocabulary of neuroscience is completely borrowed from computer science, what are the implications? Yeah, let me, let me clarify the first one. So I, so I put that borrowing in very stark, sort of simple um, terms. So thank you for that question very much. <clears throat> it enables me to make it a little bit less um, um, of a caricature. Um, neuroscience al also borrows, uh, or not builds its own vocabulary, but also borrows a lot of vocabulary from psychology, uh, obviously, as you may imagine. In fact, actually, the, the, the neuroscience department here uh, in, in Oxford um, or the neuroscience research here is uh, under the experimental psychology department. That's uh, the old terminology. But <coughs> just to give you a sense. Um, so not all vocabulary uh, in neuroscience is borrowed, not like uh, wholeheartedly and happily from uh, uh, computational uh, terminology, but a lot of that is. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, Anna and Sophia for uh, reminding us uh, of the consequences of that. It doesn't um, come without a huge legacy. Mm -hmm. The moment you start talking about computation, input, output, threshold, network, etc., is when you buy, you know, without even critically thinking about it, a whole framework. In fact, uh, you, know, you must have heard this, uh, the, the three grandfathers or fathers or whatever of uh, machine learning, they disagree about what the machine learning is or is not moving towards uh, full AI, the sort of uh, sci-fi uh, Star Wars kind that uh, I, I find totally unbelievable. But one of them, I will uh, probably, I should try to find the, the YouTube videos. Um, uh, the one who has been most vocal, um, you'll probably remember the name and uh, maybe, I mean, you, you will, uh, the one who has uh, resigned from Google, um, starts with an H, uh, we'll find it. Um, uh, Jeffrey. Yes, exactly. Um, he, you should not just look at what he says about AI, but you should look at the videos when he speaks about uh, human mind. It's brutally computational and it's brutally oversimplified. So if I may say something, that is exactly the bad effect of inheriting without critically understanding what you're doing, the whole concept of vocabulary from computer science into neuroscience what you're really doing at some point, you're worried that you are creating a human or superhuman mind, not because your technology has finally reached the level of a mind, but because you have downgraded a human mind to such a computational, oversimplified, tick tock, clack, click kind of thing that of course, you know, your neural network or your machine learning is able to imitate or surpass it. That is exactly the risk that we uh, encounter when we import a whole vocabulary which is conceptual, theoretical, and comes with a framework from a discipline into another without paying attention to all the consequences that come with it. So my invitation, and I, if, I, if, if, if anyone finds the, the right videos, uh, please share them uh, uh, on this um, chat. Uh, if I find them, uh, I'll put them there. But it's quite remarkable to see the reductionist approach of someone who clearly is coming from that perspective of uh, having a 100% simply computational understanding of uh, mental life. If you want to have a precedent of that approach, uh, you find it in uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Hobbes, the famous uh, political philosopher, Leviathan, etc. cetera. Um, Hobbes compares thinking to reckoning, an old word that you don't use in English uh, much these days, but it means literally calculation. Uh, for Hobbes, all there is into in thinking is calculation in the simple arithmetical sense of the word, reckoning, that, that's what it means. Um, if you have that sense of mental life, well, as soon as you have a, a computer that does that reckoning better, you start getting worried, and you should be. I mean, the consequence is that you should definitely be worried. The trouble is with the premise. Given those premises, you should be worried. Luckily, the premises are completely ungranted, so you shouldn't be worried. If A, then B, so how do I remove uh, the particular B? Well, because uh, you are really speculating about an A that is not to be found uh, anywhere. 
Now, uh, at the, run, uh, the risk of running uh, a uh, sort of uh, logical mistake, um, the only way of uh, refuting uh, A is by um, sort of proving that B doesn't uh, fall. So if A then B, not B, therefore not A. Uh, what I just told you is that if you have that kind of framework and the framework leads to a particular problem that you are worried about, well, maybe you should be worried about that problem unless the whole framework is not there to be uh, endorsed to begin with. Let's move to the next question, which, uh, uh, maybe we have a, a, a few more minutes and, we, and then we can close. Thank you. We have two, two questions. Um, how can we expect technology to shape our aspirations? Well, this is essentially the second half, uh, what we're going to see tomorrow. Uh, so let me not uh, give away the, uh, the punchline, um, but uh, it's part of the even broader, um, and not for this uh, set of lectures, but you find this in uh, in a book that is forthcoming, the transformation of um, politics into a marketing exercise. Once you start marketing uh, ideas, hopes included, uh, then uh, um, you can see marketing, advertisement, uh, propaganda as ways of shaping hopes. And today, uh, the hopes that we are culturally um, uh, offered by uh, our society are pretty much sort of commercial hopes, um, hopes for uh, uh, more uh, uh, wealth, uh, more uh, um, opportunities, more power, uh, more productivity, but more on this when we cover that. Uh, uh, but thank you, that question shows that uh, you, you definitely uh, followed uh, and how the, the, the lecture needs to address that point uh, tomorrow morning. Thinking in the right direction. Um, okay, so then maybe this is the last question. How do we how do we stimulate awareness in our listeners about the fact that we are describing something by borrowing language from a pre-existing, likely unfit discourse? It's not just AI, but other modern technology practices like data sharing, for example. Yeah. Uh, good question, and that's a difficult one too. So thank you. Um, uh, and by the way, no, thank you for all these questions that um, definitely uh, push uh, the limits of what we are discussing in in the right sense of pushing it. It, there, there is really no uh, easy solution. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of um, uh, classic uh, maneuvers, um, and anyone in this uh, chat can probably uh, put them on the back of an envelope. The super classic, which I don't want to uh, overemphasize because it's good almost for anything, is education. Well, thank you. I mean, like education, 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 of course. <coughs> that is crucial, and it will always be crucial. It remains crucial. So not worth emphasizing too much. The other one, and you see why I'm disappointed by it, would be better mass media, but we don't have them. In fact, if anything, today, the mass media are part of the problem, no longer the solution. One of the tragedy of the digital revolution have moved, uh, as we would say in American context, I don't know why, but they always say it goes south, <laughs> to, to say it didn't go well um, or sour, uh, is that uh, has made one of the solutions for past problems, meaning you know, journalists, mass media, uh, freedom of speech, etc., part of the difficulty, part of the problem. If anything, today, the mass media paddle, uh, reinforce exactly the confusion we've been discussing these days. You know, they keep talking, and I'm talking about the Financial Times today, literally today talking about uh, super uh, AI coming, we need to stop it before it conquers the world. Now, honestly, take the other vocabulary. These days, reappropriation, AI is like nuclear power. It isn't, in no possible way or sense. Now, this is like, oh, 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 it's like an apple pie, as far as I know. But once you get that rhetoric, oh yes, a super powerful changes the world, could explode under my bum, and therefore we need to regulate. Oh yes, we need an agency like we have an, an, an a blah, blah. The whole thing loses any possible reasonable uh, boundaries. Thank you, mass media, for reinforcing the message. So solution number two, not really viable realistically these days because has become part of the problem. The third solution would be to have uh, scientists uh, a little bit more careful. Is that reasonable? I don't know. I know a lot of scientists, uh, one in uh, in the house, uh, who are, and they can teach a lesson or two about how careful you can be about vocabulary. But a lot of the scientists I meet, they are 
unfortunately not careful. They're not careful, and this is the last thing I want to tell you in the last three minutes. It's not because of their fault, but because they have um, hard boundaries and they rely on them. Science, hard science, the more mathematical, the more empirical it becomes, the less careful needs to be about good writing, for example, because the facts, the proofs, the evidence, the data, the statistics uh, speaks for and instead of the English use. When we say, oh, scientists write so badly, they can afford that because they have the facts and the reasonings and the numbers and the, uh, on their side. So you don't have to be Shakespeare uh, to win the Nobel, even with a paper that is sometimes for someone like me, really poorly written with no and therefore, you know, you don't need uh, if you're a good scientist, you don't need to be so careful. Let me give you just an example in distinguishing whether the brain um, uh, process data or information, which for someone like me are two different universes, because you know what I'm talking about. Here is the diagram, the facts, the proofs, the evidence, the experiments. So the language gets embedded, not culturally, not sociologically, not philosophically, but gets embedded in a number of references that are hard core, so facts and evidence and so on. So it gets that kind of a, a, a hermeneutical, we would say as philosophy, or interpretative framework, and then it's very robust. So scientists among themselves, they don't really get confused. Um, and if someone says uh, to someone else, let's say in machine learning these days, that chat GPT has had some hallucinations, well, unless, <laughs> It's not doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't think that, of course, no, he's dreaming and it's. Uh, but you find hallucinations in uh, the in the ordinary press, and the poor gentleman or lady around the corner start thinking, "Oh my good, there no these these things are cooking up their own ideas. They even have hallucinations." No, it doesn't mean that, of course, it's just a bad metaphor, a bad borrowing from another vocabulary, once again, a problem of framework, et cetera, et cetera. So solution number three, to be pursued robustly. And there is a bit of a glimpse of hope. So one, two, three, education always, and there's a lot to be done. Two, mass media, either we change their the models or clickbait, advertisement run, they're going to down, go downhill even more so than they have done so far. So not much hope over there. Solution number three, better scientists, I think we can do that. And people around us, including in this room, uh, virtually, are part of the solution. People who can uh, be conversant with different disciplines and they have and they practice multi no, disciplinarity seriously. So make sure that the scientists know the philosophy and the philosophers know the science, which is easier said than done. But more on this uh, on this campaign tomorrow. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, well, we need to teach some philosophy to the, to the scientists and some science to the philosophers who need it badly, really. Uh, but no, both sides seem to be at fault and there's a lot they can, get, can fix them. And with this, thank you so much for uh, withstanding the impact of all this <laughs> blattering on my side. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks again also to Amy uh, for the uh, direction of the <laughs> interactions. <laughs> Take care. See you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.